Okay, students, uh, what I want to do now is give you a little bit of Russian history. Uh, we need to look at it anyway uh, from the standpoint of you understanding how did Russia, you know, get to where it is today. And so this won't be extensive, I promise, but it will be enough to hopefully give you an idea of what, you know, transpired during the 20th century and how we got to the 21st century in Putin. Um, so that said, quick background, uh, you know, uh, you have any number of czars, T-S-A-R, uh, or Tsarinas, in the case of Catherine the Great here, that, that led. The last dynasty was the Romanov dynasty, so you'd, see, you'd hear the term Roman and know uh, what that means. It is a reference to um, you know, Rome itself, and if you look at Tsar, it's, it, the way it used to be spelled, it could almost be phonetically you know, uh, said Caesar, as in it was spelled C-Z-A-R. So that's what these people are, essentially, Caesars, uh, lone rulers of this, um, you know, wide-ranging uh, place we're going to call Russia. Now, it took them a while to get to it, clearly, here. So you had to come out of the forests of Moscow and also think about the Kievan Rus here in Kiev in Ukraine. You also had some, um, you know, Swedes and Vikings that are really at the beginning of all of this, to be honest with you. But then the accretion of land and the growing into what was the biggest country in the world. Remember, it also included Alaska, too. Um, and this is what we bought from them for two pennies an acre in 19, or 1867 and called it Seward's Folly. But that said, uh, this is still the largest country in the world, but it used to be bigger. So uh, with that understanding, let me at least introduce you to the last Tsar then, and the one that really kind of matters here. So Tsar Nicholas II was not an individual who really was the best choice for later, but he was the only choice. And if you just look at monarchies, by the way, um, a lot of them were, uh, just look at the family tree, and you'd find that uh, the, the son, uh, Alexei here, who was a hemophiliac, he carried that recessive gene all the way down from his I think it was his grandmother, uh, or maybe great-grandmother, I think his grandmother, of uh, Queen Victoria. Uh, but that said, what I'm saying here is that a lot of these families intermarried, German and British, to, uh, you name it. Uh, and if you want to see some of the inbreeding that went on, just look up something called the Habsburg jaw or the Habsburg chin, and you'd see it got pretty bad in some, <laughs> some of these monarchies. But that set aside here, this is going to be the last ruling family. And if you heard anything about Anastasia and the Disney stuff and all that, uh, don't get so romantic about it. All of these people were killed, uh, even Anastasia by the Bolsheviks, and so that's not going to end well. But let's see how we got to that point. So if you go back to 1905, there was a revolution then because Nicholas was not a good ruler. Uh, most people were serfs, meaning they were uh, landless, that they had to, you know, pay pay uh, with their crops and with their labor to whoever owned the land. And then, of course, uh, Russia got into um, a war with what they thought would be an easy country to defeat, Japan. But Japan was heavily militarized at that point. They beat the devil out of them, took a bunch of land from them. Um, and this did cause a revolution with labor crises, food shortages, losses in the war, you name it. Um, but it didn't take because you couldn't get the, the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks and the other powers, uh, the other competing powers to come to together and agree. Uh, one thing they did get, though, and you might want to write this down, it's a Duma, D-U-M-A, and this is a lower house of basically parliament and elected officials. So there was some give, but not still, not a lot changed. And you saw uh, Lenin, Trotsky, and many of the other uh, Bolsheviks rise to power as uh, World War I really kicks in. So World War I starts in 1914, and it is a terrible uh, situation for the Russians. Heck, just one in one battle alone, they they uh, lost you know, tens of thousands of men and over 100,000 uh, captured in Tannenberg is what it was called by the Germans. The Germans were pretty tough on these guys, and so they they beat the putty out of them. And eventually, what ends up happening is, um, um, you know, the Bolsheviks take over. They sequester. Uh, the Tsar and his family out in a city called Yekaterinburg. I'll show it to you in just a moment. And uh, they try to get out of the war. They do. And then there's even a civil war. So stick with me for a moment. So who comes to power but it is Lenin and the Bolsheviks. And what does he have? Uh, a statement that is, is uh, very appealing to the people. 
where we'll get you out of the war, the peace part of it, the land. You didn't have any. You were poor. You were a serf. It was all the capitalists and the monarchists that owned all of this. And then you're hungry. You've been hungry. You'll get bread. And that was enough. They undermined the power of the czar. Uh, they, uh, you know, fomented rebellion. And they took the place over. Now, what were they following? They were following the edicts and the guidelines of Marx and Engels from the Communist Manifesto. You could read this in a short few hours. It's a short, almost like a pamphlet, to be honest with you. If you look at it where they line it out, though, uh, this, by the way, is a statue of the two men in Germany, which is where they were from. Um, but they talked about the power of the people, saying, look, what built capitalism? Was it the capitalists and the people with all the money? Was it the monarchs and the blue bloods? No, it was you. It was the people, the proletariat, through your blood, your sweat, your tears, your anguish, your poverty, all of that. You built this. You should enjoy the fruits of that. And buddy, that really resonated with a lot of people. So uh, they take the hammer and the sickle as hammer is for industry, sickle is for agriculture, and that becomes, you know, with communism and the red banner, this is saying we're all in this together. Now, this is a quick timeline. The October Revolution actually happened in November, just so you know. Why? Because the Russians are using an out-of-date calendar. They hadn't even updated. They were still using the Julian, like Julius Caesar Julian calendar. It was way out of date. Uh, everybody else had already updated, uh, updated to the Gregorian calendar. But it, tells, it kind of shows you how backward they were. Um, but then there's this thing called the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. I'll show you a slide on that in just a second, uh, which eventually led to the Civil War. And look, the Civil War, uh, 1918 and 1922. And, you know, you got the Loyalists and the Bolsheviks fighting here, the Reds and the Whites. And the um, and, and this is the city right uh, um, here when you see Yekaterinburg right here. It's named for Catherine the Great. But this is where uh, the Bolsheviks killed the Tsar and all of his family. Uh, they, they were afraid they were going to lose the Civil War, and they certainly didn't want the monarch to come back onto the throne uh, if the Loyalists and or whoever won. And so eventually after winning, they're going to form the USSR. But look at this. Uh, first, the Russians had to get really, the Bolsheviks had to get really savvy here and get out of the war. And, and Germany was just beating their skulls in, I'm just telling you. And so what ended up happening here was they sued for peace. And the Treaty of brest litovsk gave all of this blue area that you see right here on your map, all of that went to the Germans. And all of this area went to uh, Austria-Hungary, which was just, they were terrible too. This is mainly Germany against the three great powers of you know, Russia, England, and France, and eventually the United States. They still almost won the war. But that said, what did Russia give up here? Well, Trotsky wouldn't even sign off on this thing because it was so embarrassing. But that said, why they signed it? To get out of the war. They had something else to do. And in private, Lenin would say this. He would say, look, this is, I'm crazy like a fox. I didn't really give this up. He says, what I did is I got us out of war so we could have this revolution. And this revolution doesn't just stop inside of Russia. It's going to sweep all of these powers away that you see in Europe. In fact, it's going to sweep everything away. And the value of that paper will be the paper itself. It'll be worthless. And we'll get this all back again. And history would see that he was proven correct. Uh, they had... When they signed the thing, too, they lost something like 80% of all of their uh, in industry and a huge portion of their agricultural lands. But it didn't matter, again, for them. They needed out of the war to get a foothold, a toehold, in for what this, um, you know, what the USSR would be. And the USSR was this. Now, this is how it looks now. Uh, so there are 15 republics that came out of this. So you might want to memorize these. But the largest was Russia. And read about Russification, the uh, ethnic Russians being put into all these other places. So all these other places as you see on the map, what are called the near abroad, the, the, the 14 countries, um, or 15 with Russia, uh, the 14 that came out of it that weren't with Russia. And so there are the three Baltic states of Estonia, oops, sorry, and Lithuania. Uh, you've got the Eastern European states here of Belarus, Ukraine, and Moldova. In the Caucasus right here, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. And then again, in this area, Central Asia, five countries. The Stein just means the land of or the home of. So all of these are ethnic names. So the home of the Kazakhs, the Uzbeks, Turkmen, uh, Kyrgyz, and Tajiks. So this is a huge area that they're going to eventually have. Each one of these would be called an ASSR, or an Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic within the USSR. So it became a really big and powerful country. Now, uh, George Orwell, uh, Stephen Blair, who wrote about this, uh, 
if you've read this in school, a lot of you had to, but if you did it in an English class, you might not know that everything, everything in here is uh, indi indicative of uh, Stalin and Trotsky, and everything is symbolic in here from the pigs being the leaders and, you know, two feet bad, four feet good. Eventually it's going to be, you know, the pigs dressing like humans. If you haven't read it, read over it. But it reads like a short Russian history, a dystopian uh, a view of what it looks like from the inside. And was it a great, was it a great, you know, revolution for the people? No, it never was. Communism is by golly the best idea that you could ever have. And it only works on paper. You cannot assume that everybody's going to play by the same set of rules and Stalin is that guy and so this guy right here uh, you'll see here in just a moment he had some good ideas but he was he was scared to death of everything and he had the power though to control and you'll see how many people die but at least know this he had his five-year plans and it was um, it, there wasn't it was very draconian there wasn't a whole lot of incentive for people to move from the countryside into the cities to work in those factories or to use you know a few of you to make mecha a mechanization to feed everybody so literally stalin you know dragged them kicking and screaming in the 20th century but it's easy to feed a lot uh, you know a bunch of your people if you're killing off millions of them and um you know, he does mod he, he does um, modernize them. I can't lie about this. And if you look here, there were a couple different types of uh, farms. So you had the Kolkhoz, these collective farms, which, you know, the people will, um, you know, seem like in the propaganda that they're having a great time farming on, but they're not. And then you'd also have a Sovkhoz, which would be a state farm that was a little smaller and, and produced, you know, um, you know, different kinds of crops and stuff like that. But this was always a land of need. Um, and it didn't work in the same way capitalism. In fact, it, it makes no decisions based on supply and demand. And so that's what's going to eventually kill it. But that said, um, these plans were eventually interrupted by what they still refer to as the Great Patriotic War, that is, World War II. So um, when you looked at Stalin, he, you know, he looked larger than life. They always depicted him as you know, lording over the landscape, saying, we can defeat the drought, we can do this. They even tried to divert rivers, uh, running you know, downhill, uphill, to run to areas where they could farm them better. I mean, it was, it was a monumental effort that they put in to try and tame Siberia and, and, and some of this difficult landscape that I talked about in my physical geography and the environment lecture. Um, that said, they did make some Herculean efforts and were able to get, you know, a lot out of the land more than they ever had before, but it came at quite a cost in people and destruction of the environment. So they also had this real quick. The um, the great proletariat success was actually the um, the Gulag Archipelago, which is in your textbooks, uh, uttered uh, by and written about by Alexander Solzhenitsyn in a three-volume set, talking about how all these political prisoners were forced out here and, and work details, and most of them, you know, worked to death and died or, or whatnot. And even Trotsky, uh, trying to get away, he got as far as Mexico, and that said, he was still murdered there. So um, Stalin's power was ultimate, was paramount, was everything until he finally dies. And so what was your incentive? It, you know, propaganda makes it look like you're having fun with the wheat harvest and everybody, you know, everybody's all happy and fat, right? No, they're not. Uh, they don't get any extra money. They don't get any extra anything. They get a, you know, a medallion that tells them they're a good Soviet. Um, but they, you know, the harder they work, Nothing extra comes from it. So what is the incentive? It's fear. And when you see these quotes from a guy like Stalin, and by the way, he's not an ethnic Russian. He's Georgian, and he changed his name, too, as a lot of these guys. V.I. Lenin changed his name. But Stalin means steel. And so when you think, it's almost comical to think, you know, oh, Joe Steele's coming in to lay the smack down on people. And you might chuckle about it, but good Lord, he killed so many millions of people. It's just incredible. Um, and when you look at just one thing here, the Ukrainians, yes, they are Slavic speakers, but they're different from the Russians. And this was where they had the breadbasket of the country. And these farmers said, you know, let's not farm so hard. Let's make sure that we, you know, we give them incentive to give us our land back. And what did Stalin do but send trucks down and hauled all away, hauled all the food away? He saw this as Ukrainian nationalism. And uh, and he let these people starve to death. And so Holodomor, get that down because that is a genocide. And when you look at people dying, you know, 25,000 know, people a day, you're talking about some really difficult times. And if you look in uh, Kiev today, the Holodomor uh, Memorial, that's what you'll find. So um, 
I'll wrap up here by saying we've already kind of covered uh, the spheres of influence in the Cold War. Uh, so look that back up, that map in, in Chapter 8 in Europe. And then also, this was the last thing you'd seen from my uh, previous lecture about Glasnost and Perestroika with Mikhail Gorbachev, and that's going to wrap it up. So I hope this works out well for you guys. See you in the next one. Bye-bye.